Welcome to the Sexual Communication Module, Module 3. Men and women have different bodies, different backgrounds, and different ex early experiences, so without some clear explanations, they rarely figure each other out when it comes to what each other wants sexually. Once you really get that becoming a skillful sexual communicator can tremendously improve your enjoyment of your sex life, you may find out that you get motivated to put aside your embarrassment or uncertainty. And why would that be? Well, here's a short list of things that don't get better without good communication. First of all, hoping that your partner will somehow figure out that you really want some changes made in how you make love. The times when your partner says, not tonight, honey, might well be more about things that haven't been made clear than about lack of desire. Letting your partner know that some things he or she does cause you pain. For example, bending the penis down too far when you're stroking it can hurt it, even damage it. Or for women, rubbing the delicate clitoris hard can really hurt. Another one is letting a man know that the things he says can be just as important to your arousal as the things he does. For women, foreplay starts in the morning or right after the last orgasm, not 10 minutes before the next time a man wants intercourse. But since it's different for a man, how is he supposed to know if it's not put in words? Letting a woman know that when she gives you the feeling that you're not pleasing her, it discourages you from trying to please her. So that's a short list, important reasons why getting good at sexual communication is so important. Of course, there are many more things on the list. And how do we do that? How do we get good at it? Well, the first step is developing a vocabulary, getting comfortable with the words. Those who talk about putting the ding-dong and the ta-ta are making things unnecessarily difficult. Instead, practice saying words like penis, clitoris, nipples, and orgasm until they're as easy to say as toast and eggs and bread and butter. During the years I ran a graduate program and trained sex therapists, I gave them the assignment to say 25 sex words in a sentence every day. In class, they practice on each other. My assignment would be, turn to the student next to you, and use five of the sexual words on the board in a sentence. Why make such a fuss about using the words? Because not using them makes it almost certain that heterosexual couples will never fully understand each other's needs. As I said in the introduction, no woman knows what getting or losing an erection feels like. No man knows what intercourse after childbirth or menopause feels like. Most men don't know what having your nipples sucked in just the right way feels like if you're one of those women who find this very arousing. Men often don't understand what it takes for a woman to reach orgasm. Women often don't understand how important it is for a man to feel he's pleasing his partner. As loving adults, you're allowed to talk dirty if it pleases both of you, so-called talking dirty. You're allowed to use slang such as pussy and dick and fuck me hard if you both like speaking that way. If you differ on both of the, on those things, which is common, you have to compromise. If you want him to suck your clitoris a lot, say it in whatever language works best for him. If you want to try something new and outrageous, tell her about it in terms that let her know that she would be fulfilling a fantasy for you and that would make you feel closer to her. So this is part two of module three. Two types of communication. Let's start with learning to ask each other about our feelings about sex, something that can feel very risky at first. Letting your partner know about your sexual experiences as a child and teenager and young adult is important an important way to build true intimacy. How did you learn about sex in the beginning? You could ask your partner, and your partner's answer to this may give you an important uh, window into understanding him or her. 
My parents never said a word about it, is a common male experience. Is the unspoken message that men figure this out on their own? Often women have been told very little as well, but they're usually told that they have to protect themselves in some way. Here are some other examples of early messages that may have had a negative sexual effect on the listener. My mother told me how babies were made, but her main point seemed to be that having sex before marriage was a sin. My dad told me not to get a girl pregnant. He said that could ruin my life or at least keep me from going to college. Use a condom or don't do it, he said. Don't rely on a girl telling you she's on the pill. Some girls lie or they make mistakes. Don't take chances. Mom said boys only want one thing. Don't believe them when they tell you you're the most beautiful girl in the world. That just means I want to sleep with you. So those are some of the negative messages, but there are some positive ones such as Mom told me that the sex was the best thing God ever gave us. Dad said, find the right girl and do what comes naturally. You'll love it. My folks believed in sex education by books, someone said. I got books on menstruation, books on birth control, books on making good choices. When I got married, they sent me books on pregnancy. Actually, all the books were helpful. Along the way, I found people to actually talk to. Once you've begun a dialogue with your partner, look for opportunities to talk about specific sexual preferences. Most basic of these is discussing how you each like to be touched. Sometimes the dialogue may begin with a question. When I touch your clitoris or vagina, what feels best? By the way, when I'm touching your clitoris, am I on target? Maybe you should show me how you pleasure yourself. What's your favorite way for me to stroke your penis? I'd like to touch your G-spot, but I don't know exactly where it is or even if you want me to touch it. And she might not know the answer to that. For general information, the G-spot is located, as you can see on this dialogue, your, this uh, graphic, the G-spot is located inside the vagina on the upper wall, about two to three inches from the opening. You can identify it with a gentle, lubricated finger. And you feel for tissue that feels spongy rather than smooth. Some women respond really dramatically to having this area stimulated. If your mutual anatomy is just right, the stimulation might happen when you're having intercourse. But usually not. It usually requires one or two fingers. And most women can't do that to themselves unless they use a dildo or some other sex toy. For some women, stimulating the G-spot and the clitoris at the same time can be dramatically arousing. It's worth some experimentation to find out. There's another problem with not being able to talk things out. One or both partners may have ways in which they're not satisfied. Worse, either or both may have certain issues where they find a particular touch or act annoying or distracting. Every time it happens, arousal might fall, or the person may feel frustrated instead of pleasured. Talking skillfully about that is not easy, but it's so important to be able to do it. It's not fair to expect your partner to be a mind reader. Talking about sex in terms of techniques can be informative to a partner and very empowering to the speaker. Learning that it's safe to let your partner know what you want is very precious. If you can learn to do this in the spirit of, I'd love this, if you try it, there can be lovely results. That's an example of skillful communicating. You don't criticize, but you say, this would be lovely if we tried this. Whether or not you both decide to try that particular thing, you become closer. And next we have the action steps. So the action steps for this sexual communication module start with first making an appointment with each other to talk at a specific time at a specific topic. 
If that seems difficult, limit the first session to 10 minutes. Divide it in half. One of you starts and speaks for five minutes, more or less, without interruption. You stay on the designated topic, or at least start with it, but then you can say whatever else is on your mind. Then the other partner speaks for five minutes, not necessarily responding to what the first one has said, but instead speaking from your own heart about whatever you need to say. So, good topics that you could start with usually begin with the positive. Things like, my favorite things we do in bed. My fantasies about things we could try. Things I'd like you to know about what I like. And things I'd like to know about what you like. And how feeling emotionally close to you affects me sexually. That's a very important one. Number three is apologies and appreciations. You'll find that I mentioned this exercise on several modules because it's useful in many situations. It's especially valuable though where sexual communication is concerned because a lot of things never get communicated because of resentments and hurt feelings Apologies and appreciations can dispel a lot of the feelings that go with this situation. So try to find 20 uninterrupted minutes for this exercise. Decide who will be first, partner A, and switch the order the next time. So for five minutes or less, partner A gives voice to all the apologies that he or she can think of all the things I haven't apologized for. <laughs> and then when you run out, you ask your partner, is there anything else you want me to apologize for? Usually there will be a few. <laughs> Don't apologize falsely, as in I apologize for not taking the garbage out when you really mean that your partner doesn't do his or her share of this like some other chore. On the other hand, you could say, I apologize for not doing my part to get a clear agreement with you on how we're going to handle the trash. The aim, the aim of this exercise is to build authentic goodwill. Now B does his or her apologies. So you switch and the other partner starts doing apologies following the same format. And partner A listens without comment. Then the, then the speaker says, is there anything else? Did I leave out anything you wanted me to apologize for? So when you've done that part, you get to the more enjoyable part, the appreciations. And in, he, in this part, for five minutes or more, partner A voices as many appreciations as possible. The other one listens attentively, and when you run out, remember to ask your partner, is there anything else you would like me to appreciate? And you do that, and then you reverse roles. Now the third exercise is making a date for the next time you will talk like this. Put it on your calendar, and change it only by mutual agreement. And don't forget to take a look at the resources below. As in all the modules, there's a number of articles and other things that you may find of interest. One of them in this case is uh, the 13 sexiest things you could say to a woman. So look underneath the action steps for those.